Kabbalists teach that as the beginning of the month, literally the first few moments go, so goes the entire month. Welcome to Spiritually Hungry. <laughs> well, as Yosef mentioned, we're very excited to be here with all of you. Uh, some of you knew some of people we know for a long time. This is a very important month. And as Yosef also mentioned, the Kabbalists teach that as the beginning of the month, literally the first few moments go, so goes the entire month. And therefore, it's been a tradition for thousands of years for Kabbalists, for those who understand the importance of the what we call Rosh Chodesh, the beginning of the month, to come together. Because whatever light and energy I or you individually can awaken and receive is magnified that much more when we come together. And really, the reason why we're here tonight is not so much because we have the opportunity to share with you, but because we know that our month will be that much more powerful because we bring it together in with all of you here tonight. So I want all of us to, again, begin our consciousness there, that the gathering on the new moon, by and within itself, with the right consciousness, of course, awakens for all of us the potential for a much more powerful, a much more fulfilling, a much more blessed month over the next four weeks, of course. And as Monica and I were thinking about what we want to share with you, the Kabbalists teach, and this is a very deep concept that the Zohar, the foundational text of the Zohar speaks of, that there's a concept or an energy called the O Haganuz. Literally, it means the concealed light. In our world, there is what is revealed. We all have revealed goodness in our own lives. But we are destined for so much more. Both our world, and again, unfortunately, we see so much darkness in our world. It's obvious that there must be, that there is so much more concealed light. And the gift of this month, and therefore the gift of us coming here together to maybe awaken our consciousness, our thoughts, is that we have the ability in this month, as in no other time of the year, to awaken both within ourselves and in our world a great revelation of that concealed light. So our hope is, for Monica and myself, to share with you some ideas, some concepts, some consciousness that will enable all of us to truly maximize the gift and the power of this month so I hope, as, uh, I hope as much as I say, you know, when, whenever Monica and I record Spiritually Hungry, it's kind of our date night and thousands of people listen to it <laughs> as well. So Monica and I are here on a date. We're going to have a conversation and we hope that you enjoy listening in on our conversation. Usually we're facing each other locked in the gaze, yes. but not tonight. <laughs> Actually, if I can share, when we started the podcast... As, as he always as, asks if he can share, but he doesn't wait for me to say, yeah, share. Yeah, yeah. That's fine. So um, <laughs> when we started the podcast... It was during COVID, and we had only one microphone, so literally we were sitting like this. Not, not just facing each other, but literally right in front of each other's face, because we had to talk into one microphone. Now we're a little bit more distant, but... Our knees were touching, and talk about intimacy. Yeah, that was fun. Do you want to go back to that style? Maybe. That's my, not, not a bad idea. <laughs> so most people are very excited for the month of Sagittarius. Nothing wrong with Scorpio, of course, but for some it seems to be a challenging month. And uh, people are eager to welcome in this new month. The other reason is that our potential can really be revealed. And when we talk about potential, it's not just the potential of how we can use our bodies, but also our minds and also our capacity to love. We limit ourselves in so many ways, mostly through our negative thoughts about ourselves. We limit ourselves and what we can do and what we can offer for a myriad of reasons. So we're going to go through that. We're also going to, going to give you tips and tools. I have found, even in finding my voice, the hardest obstacle was discovering who I wanted to become, but also giving myself permission to do that. It's difficult to meet yourself and really allow yourself to shine and to be seen because it requires vulnerability. 
but know that it's possible and know that what you have the ability to do is far beyond anything that you can visualize in your current lens because your current lens is very much connected to, again, limitation based on past experiences, trauma, uh, doubt that you have. And so we're gonna move that noise away from you tonight and really tap you into your potential. So I love sharing stories and Michael loves listening to them. And even do. if he doesn't, he I is do. forced to every week. So I'm gonna share three short stories with you. Go for it. You like three? Yes. Three. Okay. So the first is, well, they're all true stories. This is in Quebec in 2006. A 41-year-old mother, Lydia, was walking with her sons when nearby children alerted her to an approaching polar bear. I guess that is part of the issue with living in Quebec, perhaps. So fun fact, our daughter Miriam, our oldest daughter, just last week, she's a Gemini, so she has a lot of random information that could either be very useful or not at all. I think this actually happens to be useful, and you, I hope none of us have to use this ever, but I think that if you ever come across a bear, you're gonna think of me. So if you come across a brown bear, brown, lay down. Black, fight back. White, good night. Just saying, okay? So Lydia told her sons before to run before placing herself between the polar bear and the children. The polar bear, of course, attacked, and Lydia attacked right back. She kicked and she punched the 700-pound bear. When the bear swatted her, Lydia fell on her back but continued to kick the bear with her legs. And fortunately, a bystander, again, Quebec, happened to have a rifle, which he then shot into the air six times and then shot the bear. Okay. I don't know, this is not my story, this is the story. So Lydia came away from the incident with very little injury and her children were not harmed at all. This phenomenon is called hysterical strength. So Lydia was hysterical. Hysterical strength describes the extraordinary display of human strength. It's usually prompted by life-threatening issues. Now, they can't fully prove this because I think that would be unethical, right? You're not going to put somebody in this situation to really prove the fact, but situations show us this. We've also heard of parent lifting, right? Have you heard of that? I have not heard of it. Yes, you have. You parent don't, lifting? You don't know you have. No. Who here has heard of parent lifting? You've heard? Okay, sorry. No. <laughs> <laughs> Monica always likes when she knows things I don't know. I love it. Happens it, often. It, it happens often. Not often, often enough, but I love it. So this is a story of his... Gilberto's enjoying <laughs> it back there. <laughs> so it's basically when a parent lifts a vehicle to save a child. Okay. So now you've heard of it? I've heard of it, okay, yes. Okay, there you go. So this appeared on CNN in the, and in the Washington Post in 2019. 16-year-old Zach Clark was outside with his mother when they heard someone crying out for help. They found their neighbor pinned underneath his car. Again, I don't know how people find themselves in these situations, but that was where their neighbor was. Zach was a high school football player, and he moved quickly in front of the car, lifting it just long enough for the two women to roll the man out from underneath it. The man came away with non-life-threatening injuries, and Zach experienced a sore back and legs. Now, Zach, at his best day in the gym, could lift 400 pounds, but on this day, he could lift 3,000. So again, if we just talk about body, right, what our potential is and how we use our bodies, it, we obviously are not tapping into the potential of that. And I'm going to give you one more story. One more story. This is about our brain. Dr. Evelina, and I can't pronounce her last name, Federinko, of MIT, she had the opportunity to study a girl named E.G. This is not her real name. She wanted to protect herself. But she was born with part of her brain missing, the left temporal lobe. They thought maybe she had a stroke when she was still in the womb. The left temporal lobe, for those who know, is responsible for language. So she shouldn't actually be able to process any languages, but she was bilingual. So again, how does that happen? Now you can say it's a miracle and this is the month of miracles, but more than that, if we look at ourselves as a whole being, our body, our mind, our spirit, be honest with yourself. I mean, just think about your day or think about last week. How much of your day was used and utilized to your full capacity and potential, either in what you wanted to achieve, create, manifest, love you wanted to offer, how you used your mind, how you used your words, where you placed your actions, right? This is what tonight's about, and it's perfect for this night because, again, it's the new moon, and we have the ability to inject this month with anything we really want to when we start it on the seed of the month. 
So there's some myths about our brains as well, because a lot of people say we only use 10% of our brains, which actually is not true. We use all of our brains, but we don't use it necessarily to the in the ways that we should, to how we should, right? So we think we're only using a short amount of it or a small amount, but in fact, we're using all of it, but just not to the best of our ability. It's interesting, you know, as I think about this, and I really, you know, as Monica and I have the opportunity to travel to the different centers, many cities all over the world, countries all over the world. And for me, this is something that I'm very passionate about. I think that the reason our world is in the state that it exists right now, and certainly why so many of our lives are not as they should be, is simply because we are not living our potential. But you can't even begin to think about how you're going to live your potential until and unless you actually accept that whatever your life is right now, and many of us are very happy, many of us have, have success in one way or another, but the disparity between what we are actually capable and more importantly need to do in our world is so far beyond anything that we're currently doing. And when I think about this, you know, we speak about spiritual concepts, but for me, the understanding is, and I, I, I used to mention this a lot in our house, and our kids got kind of tired of me repeating this, but most of us know that science has found that our world, our physical world, forget about anything spiritual, is, lim is endless and ever-expanding. So there is no end, there is no limit to the physicality, to the space, of our world. Also, science has not found any limit to time. So the two main aspects of the physical world, time and space, are, as the scientists tell us, completely limitless. Well, it only makes sense then that each one of us, living within limitless time and limitless space, has the ability to be limitless. But you cannot even begin that journey. And this is what I think is so exciting, no matter where you are in your life, to know that the potential of what you can and are meant to do, the potential of the life that you're meant to have, is not just greater, exponentially greater than what you're experiencing now, but that it actually has the need and the ability and the possibility to be limitless. Well, I was meeting with a couple today that were, they've been married... 18 years, they have two teenage children that are having issues. And so they are now looking at the relationship and what kind of role models they're being, because there's a lot of different things happening in the house. And the first question I asked them was, is there still love in this relationship? Do you both have a commitment to making it work? And also, do you believe that you can have a happier marriage, a life together, that you can enjoy each other once again. Because if you don't desire those things and you don't think it's possible, then let's not waste any of our times. Because if you can't see it, right, you can't visualize it and you can't, don't believe that it's actually possible, you can repeat the same story over and over again. And towards the end of the conversation, the wife said, well, I already know what tomorrow's gonna look like. And I said, did you really just say that? What do you want tomorrow to look like? Why don't you write down what you want to do, how many times you want to speak to your husband, what you want the conversations to look like, right? So our ability to create is endless, but too often we get into this rut of repetition and limitation. We think that change and growth is out of our reach. Absolutely. And time and space, I think, as you, and I want you to unpack that a little bit because I know what you're saying, but I think we live in a world that is based on schedules and routine and structure. And, you know, there's a 6 a.m. club and there, I mean, even the way we eat and food combining, I mean, everything is very specific and very planned out and methodical and it's all ruled by time and space. So we're asking people to go beyond that. Well, more than that, right, because we are limited by the stories we tell ourselves. And if we're honest, if we're honest, I think most of us would admit that even on our best days and in, in our best thoughts of our potential for our lives in all areas, there's still a limit. And as long as that's the case, as long as we still tell ourselves the story of limitation, there's no way we even begin to, to live the life that we're meant to live. 
So, I you know there, there's there's again there's also a lot of research on this, but that there's a statement, and I've shared this those of you who are with us on on the uh, on Rosh Hashanah. There's a statement that I think to most of us will sound crazy. Maybe you've heard it before. I've said it a few times. It says that a person needs to imagine, needs to say to him or herself, for me, the entire world was created, right? That from the beginning of time until this moment in time that I find myself, all of that existed just so that I, me and my soul can reveal its light. And if you think about that, and this is, again, what I, what I hope for myself and for all of us here tonight and all of our friends who will be listening to the podcast, that we literally break the mold of the story that we tell ourselves. How many of us actually believe that the significance of my life, the significance of my soul existing right now in this moment in time, is so important and what I am about to do, what I am going to do with my life, no matter again, no matter where we find ourselves, whether you're you know young or old or middle, whatever, but that what I'm about, to, what I'm going to do, is worth the entire creation. But what does that mean, worth the entire creation? Meaning that what I'm going to do is going to be so significant that what I am going to bring into this world is going to be so important and powerful that it is worth all creation from the beginning of time till this moment. So let's unpack that a little bit because it's so big, right? How it's easy to find yourself overwhelmed. Like, what do you mean? So if I don't find what I'm supposed to do and it's not huge, then what's my purpose? I know that's not what you're saying. But let's give the example of somebody who is a stay-at-home parent, right? And they might find that that's not big enough if we're talking in the realm of like the whole world was created for me. What you need to see, though, is you don't know what your your words, your influence, your impact on that child, that being that, by the way, you created or you went to great efforts to bring into the world. What is that child meant to do? Or maybe you just came to this world to inject energy there. Right. I think far too often when we look at what our potential is, we put it as it has to be something that's never been done before. Or if it's been done, it has to be done better than it was ever done. Right. And I think even let's say if you want to be the next Martha Stewart or whatever it is, it's like, okay, well, I have a desire to do that, but who can do it better than her? She's already done it. So we, we come up with these different narratives that really limit us before we even put ourselves fully out there. It's a very good point. I, but I, I want to say one thing just to underscore something that you said before, and I think it's so important. And that is, again, we have to begin with at least opening up our thoughts, our mind to the understanding that I am meant to be limitless. And we'll talk about exactly what that means. But as long as we're telling ourselves a limited story, even on our best days, there's no chance of us actually living the life that we're meant to live. So that's first. You literally have to wake up every morning and remind yourself, and again, I would say at least a few times a day, I have limitless potential. Literally, that simple story that none of us actually believes, even if we've heard it and we read books about it and we heard podcasts about it. So you have to wake up every morning, literally, and remind yourselves throughout the day, I have limitless potential. And that means now, that you are super powerful, right? Limit, like Limitless potential means that you are so powerful that anybody that you come across, you can influence them and change their lives to the better and yourself. Anytime I meet any, anytime I have a random conversation with somebody I didn't even know, or I didn't expect to have a conversation with, I always take it as a sign. There's something that I need to say here or need to learn here. I never see it as random. Absolutely. And to, and to your second point, you know, I, I wrote a note for myself and, and I actually like what it says. Tonight? Uh, yes, tonight. <laughs> no, before. The power of small influence. The power of small influence. Like Monica said, sometimes when we think about... I love that. We didn't even know we were both going to say the same thing. <laughs> so sometimes when we, when we hear the concept of limitless potential, it's outwardly focused, which means I'm going to do something so great, so many people are going to think that I am great. It is outwardly focused, which is completely the wrong focus. There's, if I, I'd like to quote, is a very interesting book. It was written by uh, an NYU professor who passed away, but he wrote a book called The Infinite Game. And it's basically the idea that there are two ways to live life. He compares it to a game. He calls it the finite game and the infinite game. And that actually 
the right way to live life is what he calls the infinite game. And I'll just quote a little bit from the book. And I do recommend it. It's a very interesting book. Again, it's not that easy to read, I don't think, but it's a really uh, influential and important book. There are at least two kinds of game, by which he means the way to live life. A finite game is played for the purpose of winning. An infinite game for the purpose of continuing the play. Finite games are those instrumental activities from sports to politics to wars, in which the participants obey rules, recognize boundaries, and announce winners and losers. The infinite game, there is only one, includes any authentic interaction, from touching to culture, that changes rules, plays with boundaries, and exists solely for the purpose of continuing the game. So the idea is that it's not about, again, what anybody outside of me is going to think of me. It's about me, in his terms, when I play the infinite games, it means that everything that I do is with the thought that it can be infinite. So I'll share with you, last night, we, uh, we were celebrating one of our teachers, those of you who know, Benjamin Malul, and we were sharing a few different things. And something that I shared, it's a thought that I had this past Shabbat, this past Saturday. Some of you might know, might not know, the, 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 in, the, in the Torah, in the Bible, the first book is called Genesis. And it's a very interesting book, even on a literary, literary level, but of course, Kabbalistically, it has many secrets. The first book of Genesis is, again, there's literally probably thousands and thousands of books, interpretations, secrets written about it. And I was thinking about it, because we are in the middle of reading that book, I thought about this, this Shabbat this Saturday. And the question that came to mind is, how many people are we talking about? Well, if you count, you're literally talking about about eight people. There's Abraham, those of you who know the story, there's Abraham, his wife Sarah, Isaac, his wife. There's six, eight people. And that whole story is the foundation, certainly of the Judeo-Christian tradition. It's the foundation of so much of what makes up our, certainly the wisdom and philosophy of our world. It wasn't thousands of people. It wasn't thousands of people. So the power of small influence. And then I, I am reminded, those of you who know, or some of you might not, that the center, the Kabbalah Center, um, has existed for about 100 years. My parents really, um, about 50 years ago, began the, the greater, um, call it revolution, of bringing this ancient wisdom to the world. My father learned with his teacher from 1962 to 1969, seven years. His teacher passed away in 1969. My father's teacher had many, call them, you can call them students, none of them really remained. He only had one student. So if you look at the life, and he lived, he passed away young at age 69, but he, in his 69 years, influenced only one person. In turn, that one person influenced millions of people. And therefore, it's a, one of the worst things to live our potential is to ask the question, what am I going to do that people will lift me up for or respect me for? That's the wrong thought. When we speak about limitless potential, it might be, and I often, you know, Monica and I often say this, you know, we're very blessed to have, you know, hundreds of thousands of people listen to our podcast, but if there's this one person who we influence, then it is all worthwhile. So when we're talking tonight, and every single person sitting in this room, and every single person listening to us, has much greater both potential and need to influence, but it doesn't necessarily mean what others will think, and actually that's the wrong way to go about it, is to think about what others, how others will see you through it, but rather my soul's expression of its power can be towards one person, can be towards 10, can be to my children, can be to my wife. That we don't even care about as long as we are waking up every single morning with the thought, I know that my light and my soul and my power is limitless and I will go in the world with that consciousness and allow my infinite light to be revealed. Yeah, I think to your point, it's really about waking up. I think that it's easy to get into a rut. And like the example I gave earlier of parenting, you can go through your day and think you're not really 
affecting change or influencing or your imprint in this world isn't great, but you never know what that one person might do or if that's the, the real reason you came into this world. So it's a rethink moment for all of us. What is it that you are putting energy into each day and how do you feel about it? Does it feel trivial to you or does it feel important? Does it feel purposeful or do you want to do something else? And by the way, if you want to do something else, go and do that because you can waste, waste a lifetime doing things that people expect you to do or that you think is the right thing to do. And it's a waste of a life. The Kabbalist theory talks about something called the surrounding light and that everybody has their light that influences the world. And usually it's about six or seven feet around them. But really, if you're thinking about this consciously every day, your influence should affect outside your home. It should go into a different state, into a different country. It should be able to be felt in all parts of the world, ultimately. And if you want to really look at your own life and see where you are in revealing your potential, stop and look and think about what I'm doing each day. Is it in my comfort zone? Is it in the realm of what I know, right? So you might even be great at what you do, but then what is after that? If you really want to know if you're meeting your potential, it has to be something that is so far beyond what you can even see. It's beyond what you can imagine. And I can tell you personally, anything that I have ever done has been something that I didn't prepare to do, that I didn't think about doing, that I didn't study that I actually had a desire and I went and I moved forward in that energy. And it's overwhelming, really. The things that I try to achieve each day, each month, each year is beyond what I think is in my capability or even possible. And that is how you reach your potential. That's how you show it. It's about showing up each day in that way. And far too often we play it safe and we make ourselves small. And then we get upset at other people for not believing in us. But it really starts within. Yeah, I, would, I think that's a very important point. So if we're thinking about it, and I know this is, uh, I think, I hope most of our desire to be able to live a life that is limitless in, in all ways. Unless you are doing something that is uncomfortable for you every single day, there's no possibility of living a limitless life. There's no possibility of revealing the light and the power that you're meant to reveal in this world. So I would say, you know, you know, so often people ask, you know, why is it, you know, I'm doing this or I'm doing that? Why aren't I manifesting my potential if you say it's limitless, if I believe it's limitless? And the answer is because one of the ways to make sure that we are living a limitless life, you have to be doing something that's uncomfortable. You know, often people ask the question, how do you know if you're living your life as you're meant, how do you know if you're actually living your potential? So I always use myself as an example. Some of you might know or might not. Um, by nature, by nature, I am somebody who... Quiet. I, I, quiet? <laughs> yes, quiet. I don't, I don't necessarily enjoy um, speaking in public. I don't necessarily enjoy being with many people. But, but I know that in order for my soul to reveal its light in the world, it's not just to ask you, enough to ask yourself the question, what are my abilities? You have to ask yourself the question, what am I doing that is uncomfortable for me to do in order to reveal my infinite light? And it must be uncomfortable, which means think about your day, think about your week. How many things are you doing to reveal your potential? to live your life that are not something that are yours by nature, that they make you uncomfortable. And in order to live a limitless life, you have to be every single day, I would say a few times a day at least, doing actions that you are not comfortable with, doing actions that take you out of what is natural for you. So there is something that limits our potential, and I think it's important to talk about, um, and that's trauma. And I think far too often it's a word that's used loosely and frequently, but trauma is trauma. And it's very much not just what's happened to us, but how we feel about what has happened in our life and how that limits us. There's a quote by Ralph Waldo Emerson, and he says, the love that you withhold is the pain that you carry. I thought that was really powerful. And it's the idea that there's a vicious cycle. There's pain, which is trauma. 
causes us to withhold our love and withholding love causes us pain. So we go in this loop and it's not limited to big things that happen like war or chronic illness or violence. Trauma is any consistent pattern of behavioral or experience that creates the belief that we need to betray our true selves in one way or another to survive. I think that is so powerful as we do that even without thought, right? Something happened, we internalize it, we're changed by it, and we're not choosing the change that happens to us. So here are some lesser known childhood traumas. And I don't consider these traumas per se, but they are, it's all about parents and parenting is hard (laughs) and our power is huge. So anybody who thinks that parenting is not a real job, we affect lives here. So having a parent who denies your reality, having a parent who does not see or hear you, which is why we often find people, um, we seek out relationships that mirror that. And then we get upset that they don't see or hear us. Having a parent who lives vicariously through you and molds and shapes you to their liking. Having a parent who does not model boundaries. Having a parent who is overly focused on appearance and having a parent who can't regulate their emotions. So there is this concept called emotional addicts. Have you heard of it? I've heard of it, but I'd love to hear you expand on it. (laughs) So this is the loop of emotional Addiction is our body is addicted to neurochemical hormone releases that we seek out the same emotional hit again and again. So the brain starts to crave the feelings associated with trauma response, even though these feelings are unhealthy and it causes chaos in our lives. So that's this loop that we go in because it's something that we're used to. And there is something that physiologically happens and we go back and back time again, even though it's not healthy for us. So when trauma is not properly addressed, it drives our internal narratives, our belief systems, and we have an autonomic response. So I want you to think about the different things that have happened in your life that you're not even aware of that are dictating how you show up for yourself and how you show up for others. Because when we... And that there's another there's another really important point here that I hadn't realized. And that is emotions experienced purely physiologically take 90 seconds to pass through our body. So just think about that. If you have no story attached to what you're feeling, it goes through you very quickly. But when you have a story about it, then it goes back to that emotional addiction. So let's say somebody's hurt you, but you don't create a story. Oh, my mother did that or that was my childhood that I had you will get past the hurt very quickly, right? We've been offended by people who have been rude to us in the street and you're like, okay, yeah, I don't know, that's your problem. I don't know what just happened. It passes through you, 90 seconds. But then there's other things. That person did something to you that your mother did to you all of your life and now you're enraged, right? So that's how we stay in this loop and it steals away from the day. It steals away from our purpose. It steals really the essence of our life because we're so busy in this loop going back to it time and time again. So if you're able to sit with raw emotion without attaching thought to what's happened, you can move through it very quickly and then you can begin to heal. So what we're talking about tonight in terms of potential, there's many stages to go through. And perhaps the first is to see where you are triggered day in, day out, and why you allow yourself mentally, physically, emotionally to be distracted from your true purpose. And it could be trauma. It could be lack of belief in yourself, but I think it all starts from how we came into this world, our first experiences, and whether we've dealt with them properly or not. Can you give, you mind giving, uh, I like putting you in the spot, an example yeah, from your own life? Yeah, you love doing that to me. Yes. You don't like when I do that to you. <laughs> I try, I try. About I what, just, trauma? Trauma, yes. Do you think I've been traumatized? I have no idea. <laughs> oh, you have many ideas. Share I have no this. idea. <laughs> I have no idea, so I'm not going to say. Let me think about it. Um... Yeah, I mean, I've talked a lot about shame and um, guilt and blame, and I'm Middle Eastern, so those are very much uh, part of of our culture, and um, it took a long time to get past that, but I think I I identified the first time I ever felt shame, and it was was, I decided that it wasn't going to be part of my reality anymore, so the first time I ever felt shame shame was that it was such a it's such a silly thing but we were at we were in new york visiting uh not blood relatives but they were like and my mom's best friend and we were sitting around the tv with uh her husband my mom's best friend my sisters um 
And he walks in. We've had dinner while watching TV. And the husband walks in with a plate of fruit. And he said, would anybody like some? And I said, I would. I was nine, by the way. I said, oh, I, no, I was seven. I said, oh, I would love. And everybody went, <gasps> like, that I was rude in saying that I would like it, right? That I actually expressed what I desired and I didn't have any shame about it, but then I was shamed for it. And there were many, I mean, I ended up having an eating disorder later in life and I can't say it's because of that, but when I go back to all of the things, I look back to the first time I felt shame. So anytime I had that emotion, I felt like I should restrict or withhold for myself, whether it was food or love or connection. And and I often say for people, we all have a default emotion. And for me, it was sadness, right? It was the way that I dealt with the shame. So if you look to how you deal with any kind of dissatisfaction or discomfort, go back and it's it's an emotion that will show up. It's how you meet every time you feel that. Go back to the first time you felt that way. And now look at it in your adult self and see it for what it is. It wasn't about you. It was about whoever was experiencing that with you. It was about other people's feelings and emotions, especially as a child, it was not about you. And you've probably chosen and carried it that it should be your burden. So I think when you release that, then then the 90 second thing, the emotions really go through you and they don't stick. And, um, you know, it, it, and yes, it's all the things that we teach and do, but if I look at spiritually how, we're able to live the wisdom of Kabbalah. It's really being able to go back and bring in that aspect of the creator and everything, right? I, if I know that I am the creator because that's my potential, then at seven or eight or nine, or even now I am the creator, I am potential and I wanna meet that potential. So I have to go back to the trauma and know that that's not really who I am. That was something that was put upon me and I don't have to accept that as truth. And if you don't accept that as truth, you get to choose your own. Right. And I think, like you said, I think an important consciousness or thought around being able to live our potential is the fact that it isn't about me, right? We know people, I'm sure we've all met people like this, who believe that their success is because of them. We call it the ego. And there probably isn't a more powerful way to limit ourselves than our ego. That thought that I've accomplished this or I have this because of me. Because what really gives us power, and this is a concept that it's worthwhile both thinking about, that there is, we call it Kabbalistically, the creator or the light of the creator. And each one of us came to this world to be a limitless channel of that light. I am connected and you are connected, and every single one of us is connected to the force that created everything. So if I am able to to connect to that force, of course, there's nothing that I will ever be limited in. But to the degree that we think, and the ego is very insidious and strong, that I am the cause rather than the channel for that light, that thought of ego immediately limits whatever I'm going to do. So while it's true, and it is important that we understand that every single one of us is connected to that limitless force of creation, but it's not me. It flows through me. And those two thoughts are very different. And one of them limits, and one of them creates limitless potential. And, you know, the Kabbalists teach that if you think about any limit that ever, that you have now, what you have ever had, it was only because you believed that it was you. You know, I use the example of, you know, a water carrier. A water carrier goes to the well, and if the well is always, always flowing with water, he can bring water to everybody in the world. But if for one day he starts thinking, oh, why do I even have to go to the well, right? I, I'm, everybody believes or knows that I am the source of the water. Of course, he can no, no longer have water, for, not even for the world. He can't even have it for himself. And that is a very important consciousness because it also limits how seriously you take yourself. By the way, if you want to know, if you want to ask yourself the question, you know, how big is my ego? Or how limiting is my ego? Ask yourself the question, how seriously do you take yourself? Meaning, when people say things, do things to me, if you really see yourself as the water carrier, as, yes, I am connected to that limitless force, but I am not the limitless force, then you are actually able to live a limitless life. When you start saying, believing, 
the wisdom is mine, the success is mine, whatever it is that you have achieved is yours, and you take yourself seriously in that way, you're putting up a wall after a wall after a limitation, another limitation. So, two paradoxical thoughts. When you live with the consciousness, you wake up in the morning and you say, there is nothing that I cannot accomplish today because I am connected. I can be a channel for the limitless force of creation, for the limitless force of the light of the Creator. You can be limitless. If you wake up in the morning thinking that I am the most powerful, that I have all that I, that I have accomplished and all that I need to accomplish, always limited. Always limited. So that, that work of consciousness, to wake up every single morning with the thought, the understanding, that I can do anything and everything because I am, we call it a channel or a conduit, the water carrier for the limitless light, you will see, you will see what living a life that is limitless is. Well, I would love to hear any questions from the yeah. audience. Yeah, so, but I wanted to share one more quote and then we can open up the question, to questions. One of my favorite philosophers, he was actually the first um, person who taught psychology in the United States, his name is William James, those of you who know. But he writes the following. If this life not be a real fight, in which something is eternally gained for the universe by success, it is no better than a game of private theatrics from which one may withdraw at will. But it feels like a real fight, as if there were something really wild in the universe which we are needed to redeem. And I think that understanding that, that every single one of us, and this is why I find it most inspiring to be, hopefully inspire even one person to know that we are in a battle, but the purpose of this battle that we call life is because I and you and every single one of us has something that we need to do, something that we need to reveal. Again, maybe to a thousand people, maybe to one person, maybe to a million people. And that's what the battle of life is for. So, as Monica said, if, we, if we, have, we have time for a few questions, don't be shy. Often people are, you know what usually happens is that everybody's shy in the first few minutes, and then at the end, everybody wants to ask questions. He's not shy. So, oh, somebody, yeah. <laughs> there we go. No shy. Hello. Okay. Hi. If you don't mind sharing your name, yeah. so everybody, uh, yeah. I'll stay in two. My name is Jonathan Kimigarov. Um, so, my question is. Is there a specific like Kabbalistic framework or school of thought that your father's rabbi like studied, or was it more like eclectic and like? Oh, so broad? so he, well, it's usually a tra uh, tradition passed down from teacher to student. So my father's teacher, Rabbi Brandwine, had a teacher, Rabbi Shlach, who was the founder of the center. And for those of you who know, the foundations of of Kabbalah, certainly the foundation of the center, is a book called the Zohar, from, which is the foundational text. From which all the wisdom of Kabbalah, and that was revealed 2,000 years ago by Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. So it's just based on the Zohar mostly, you're saying? Yes, the foundational okay. text is the Zohar, yes. Right. Yes. Okay. Thank you. I'm, I'm Joel your, from oh, Long Joel. Island. And you were talking about influence, of course. And I was thinking about in my own life that the people I've not been successful in influencing, even though I've been involved with, with and I'm a very avid and devoted Kabbalah student for years, is my immediate family. And uh, my children, my wife, no, had no real interest in it, and, and nothing that I've seen, no change they've seen in me or dedication they've seen in me has inspired them to even check it out. So do I judge myself about my own inability to influence them, or just, I just That's get some good, comment good, about, good about, about that. It's a good question. You want it? So I would say two things, and of course this isn't personal to you, Joel, this is in general. I think that it's always good to question ourselves, right? Often, if people do see a tremendous change in an individual, they will be, at least be curious. That's one side of it, and that's, you know, introspection. But the other side is, like Monica was saying before, it's not, you know, if we view ourselves as a channel of limitless energy, light, then it's not so much that I want this to happen, right? Or I know that this is what I need to do. It's that I am, you know, I go through life, and, and the person that I, Brent, my, you know, my father's teacher, the Rav, uh, he probably tried to, he, I know as a fact, he tried to influence thousands and thousands of people. 
where's a person out in their own personal journey? When are they open? When are they not open? So I, I it's one of the things that that you know in, in the work that we do, you know, there's a concept that not far into you, right? When the when the student is ready, the teacher appears, and the concept is that our job is to be out there in the world, bringing light, bringing wisdom. This person will be open to it. This person won't be open to it. And rather than judge ourselves for it, you live a more simple life, right? So, like I said, like even when you know we do the podcast or I give a lecture, for me it's not you know I I have a direct influence that I desire to come from it. No, this is my soul's purpose. I believe to be sharing this wisdom in the ways that I do. If somebody listens to it, great. If nobody listens to it, also great. Because I'm not doing it, and that's why, by the way, I do recommend you know uh, the Infinite Game. Is that is that you don't live life for anybody else. Literally, you don't live life for anybody else or their reaction to you, be it positive or negative. It's just that this is this is what you need to do. You know, I used the I, I I gave this example once that the tree grows not because of the support of all the you know because everybody the trees around it or human human pe- people who come around will clap for it, right? A tree grows because that's its nature. It has to grow, and I think that's the way we want to view our life. We do hopefully the good things that we do, and we go through life expressing our soul, not because somebody will like it or not, but because this is what my soul has to do. I would just add that um, certainly don't be hard on yourself or judge yourself. It, it's set up exactly as it should be. I mean, maybe if your whole family came, maybe you'd be less connected. I don't know what would be, right? So just trust the process, one. And two, maybe just check yourself in how you share information or maybe they feel like they're pressured a little bit that this is something you really want. And so then when people feel pressured, sometimes they push back. Just let it be. Let it, accept it and just be easy about it. It doesn't mean anything. It is what it is now. It's not what it is forever. And see what happens. Do, uh, one more question. Here, one more question over here. Hello, everyone. Uh, this is really awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Caleb Kelly. And I wrote my question down. So here we go. Okay. <laughs> Um, how Keep prepared. You, I like that. I like yes, that for sure. For sure. Um, how do you continue to be on the limit on the path of being limitless and following limitless potential when people project their own limitations on you? Who does that? What? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's my answer. Who does that? What? I mean, for I think for us, if we paid attention to. Everything and anything people like, didn't like, even the good things, right? Um, we would limit ourselves. I think for us, uh, you know, of course, nobody, I think we've just gotten used to not being dependent on any feedback, not whether it's positive or negative. Because if you're really doing the work for the reasons that are, I think, true to your essence, it doesn't really matter. You show up each day and you try to connect and you try to grow. and. I think for, I can speak for both of us, we never feel like we've arrived anywhere and we never want to feel like we've arrived. So when you don't see an end and you also don't see roadblocks, then all you do is just spread your energy and your essence with the right intention and no agenda. Yeah, I I would just add that, and I think it's really, really important because we all fall to this, but, and it goes back to what we were saying before, is that to the degree that we need or desire people to give us approbation, to that same degree we will be limited by their limitation. But if we really, and this is not easy work, this has to be you know, constant reminder, constant inner conversation, I do not need anybody to either like, support, it's great if they do, but I do not need that, nor do I therefore care. Because if you care for others liking what you do, you, of course, will be limited by when they dislike what you do. If you really, and this is, I think, maybe the most important part of our spiritual work, to really make sure that we're coming from our soul. And the reason why I live my life the way I do, and and the reason I do what I do, is not because I believe anybody will be happy for me, about me because of it, but simply because I have to do it. And if I don't look to others to support me in order for me to do it, I won't be held back when they either don't believe or have their own limitations that they put on me. When we live our soul's potential, it means that we are doing it for me. 
you know, one of the, the founder of the Center of Ashlag has a phrase that I think about all the time. He says that the proper way to view life when we speak about doing is that there is only me and the light of the Creator. There aren't other people saying, go for it, saying it's terrible, and so on and so forth. It's just me and the light of the Creator. And yes, it takes work and an inner conversation to get there, but that's where you want to get to, where I wake up this morning, I wake up tomorrow morning, and I do what my soul knows, feels that it needs to do, and I don't. it doesn't matter to me. It doesn't matter to me, those who like and those who don't like. And when you're not looking to others to say, oh, what you're doing is great and you're amazing for it, then you will never be limited <laughs> by those who think that you can't or won't. We don't even hear it anymore because you're not looking for it and you're not interested in it and you're not waiting for that feedback, whatever it is. So you're able just to be and do and uh, explore. I have a sweatshirt that says, underestimate me, that will be fun. <laughs> Thank you for joining us on this new moon.